So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to um, this month's media research group. It's very nice to have you all here. Um, I'm very pleased that you could be here uh, in the middle of what's a very busy semester for everybody. So I appreciate you um, turning out. So that's very kind. Um, I am really pleased that we're able to um, provide space today for two of our doctoral researchers uh, to introduce their research and to talk about um, their, their, their projects. Um, and as we've just kind of, uh, as we've just kind of been talking about before we let you all in, uh, it's a really nice kind of uh, serendipity that, that we've ended up with with two, uh, two researchers in documentary, but coming from very, very different perspectives and uh, with very different approaches, looking at things from very different angles um, and producing very different work. So I think there will be some natural connections between, between the two talks that we're, that we're hearing today and between our two speakers. But also, um, I think this is a, a, a really great showcase for the kind of the range of, of, of media work that, that takes place um, within the school, but across the university as well. So I'm going to introduce both of our speakers uh, right now, because that seems the easiest way. So Nick Hector um, joining us first and speaking first. Nick is a, a British Canadian documentary filmmaker and an associate professor in film production at the University of Windsor, um, also in the School of Creative Arts at the University of Windsor. Uh, and Nick's work focuses on the documentary film editing process, as well as social justice and the environment, and explores um, constructed narrative in the observational documentary. And Nick is the producer and editor of the documentary films The Perfect Story, Prey and Shark Water Extinction, which we've also just been talking about before, uh, before we let everybody else in. Um, and Nick is is uh, researching with us in in the School of Creative Arts, obviously. Um, Dan is 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 coming to the end of his first year in 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 his doctorate. Have you come to the end of your first year, Dan? Are you already into your second year now? I'm through it. Perfect. <laughs> through through that tricky first year. So Dan's um, uh, into his second year then um, on the doctorate in business administration at Hertfordshire Business School, um, but is co-supervised with um, a colleague in creative arts here, Kim. Um, and obviously his research very much connects to what we do here in the media research group. Uh, Dan's background is in English for academic purposes, and he works in the Centre for Academic Skills Enhancement within the Hertfordshire Business School. Um, and Dan holds a long-standing interest in film studies and has always tried to use video and film and documentary within his teaching as an engagement tool. So uh, Dan's talk, when we get there, is an investigation into the value of business documentaries for undergraduate business education. But before we get to that point, Nick's going to kick us off uh, with his, his talk, The Way Back, an analog approach to editing the digital documentary. Whenever you're ready, Nick, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I apologize in advance for a bit of a cough. I've just gotten over COVID, so <clears throat> I apologize for my rough presentation. My research project is titled The Way Back, an analog approach to editing the digital documentary. A brief abstract. The artistic ramifications of the digital revolution are a critically neglected area in the study of documentary film editing. The literature suggests that the implementation of these new technologies indelibly changed the process and in turn the style of the art form. However, such studies remain narrow in focus and have yet to investigate the use of the analog process in a digital context as an artistic tool. This practice-based research project collects data by the means of reflective practice study of the film editing of two original medium length documentaries. This study sheds light on the relationship between craft process and artistic outcome in the professional practice of documentary film editing by comparing and contrasting legacy subtractive editing by excision and contemporary additive editing by assembly strategies in a digital context. Film editing is central to the art of documentary filmmaking. Its arrangements, rearrangements, and creative shapings of cinematic actuality are, according to Gerson, the only world in which documentary can hope to achieve the ordinary virtues of an art. Kerrigan and McIntyre reject the inspirationist view of art creation and documentary and argue that when the pre-existing is, is the artist's raw materials, process is the art form. Cinema's digital revolution of the early 21st century introduced new and complex technological tools that radically transformed the process of documentary film editing. It is necessary here to clarify exactly what I mean by the term documentary. The definition has historically been opaque. Barsam suggests it is the most abused and misunderstood term in the film lexicon. Nichols claims documentary is a term so broad as to be meaningless. 
outside the sphere of my professional practice, the terms is sometimes misunderstood as being synonymous with journalism and filmic veracity. In my community of practice, the authoritative definition is found in the first usage of the term in the English language. Gerson defined documentary as the creative treatment of actuality. This broad definition is reflective of a wide range of modes and styles found in the form. In Gerson's seminal denotation of the term, the artistic process, the creative treatment, is the cornerstone of the form. As Rota argues, the methodology of filmic creation is central to documentary, an art defined not only by subject or style, but by approach. The term film editing and the role of the film editor are widely misunderstood by the layperson. Kalpaman suggests that if people consider film editing at all, they think of the editor as being the person who takes material selected by the director, cuts out the bad bits, and then puts everything together into a coherent whole. For the purposes of this study, Swenberg and Sverison's definition is useful. The creation of meeting through, through the concatenation of, their, of components and their mutual adjustment. The complexity of this audiovisual concatenation ensures its imperceptibility, a commonly expressed artistic goal of the film editor, a self-described invisible artist practicing an invisible art. It is interesting to briefly note here the international etymological differences of the term editing. In the English language, the term is rooted in the action of excision. In many other languages, the term for this filmic task stems from the word montage, the art of creation through assembly. These contrasting etymological definitions will be a recurring theme. Documentary film editing, then, is the transformative labor that creates the documentary art project product. In the popular imagination, documentary filmmaking is the mechanical realization of a preconceived notion. However, the tumult of existence, the uncontrolled events, logistical challenges, artistic opportunities, and disappointments documentary filmmaking present render film editing a process preoccupied with extracting unregarded, heretofore unregarded narrative possibilities from source materials. Thus, while the screenplay of a fiction film is written before the filming process, in documentary film, the, in, in documentary film editing, the reverse is true. The film editing room is a place where documentarians write with pictures and sounds, <clears throat> attempting to reverse the laws of narrative entropy on a journey from chaos to story. The first century of cinema saw documentary film editors crafting cinematic narratives using tools of sellotape and scissors. The technical skills required to edit film could be learned in a matter of minutes. Mastery of the art and craft of film editing and narratology were the sole preoccupations of practitioners. The first step in the analog documentary film editing process is the inspection and synchronization of the rushes, the filmic raw materials. The process is slow and laborious, with the, with the technology requiring the editor to manually handle and screen in real time all of the filmed elements, assessing them for cinematic qualities and narrative potential. Cutting begins with an iterative, subtractive diminution of the totality of the material. Practitioners liken it to a, 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 a sculptor working with, with marble. The synchronized reels are edited by incrementally reducing the totality of the rushes of the film scene, the method methodically excising uh, sections in an iterative spiral of action, real-time screening, and analysis. This approach is described, uh, well, yes, sir, I'll move on. Previous research has established that the film production process changed little in cinema's first century. A review of key documentary films in this period suggests a causal relationship between advancements in film editing technology and shifts in creative style. The technologically unencumbered days of early silent era cinema is directly linked with the free-flowing and expressive editing of the Kino Eye, City Symphony, and Soviet montage schools. A pair of scissors and a magnifying glass were the simple tools behind the editing of sophisticated narratives of such sentiment, seminal documentaries as Man with a Movie Camera and Rain. The advent of sy synchronous single system audio and the earliest iteration of the Movioli editing machine is coincident with the shift to the state and comparatively unimaginative construction of pre-war and war era Canadian documentary film. This cumbersome and rigid manner of editing is reflected in the conservative visual narratives of war-era National Film Board creative output. The shift to double system sound recording, hand splicers, and the development in flatbed analog film editing technologies coincided with the development of cinema verte and actuality drama by Cinema B, L'Equipe Francais, and the Vancouver School. The ensu ensuing stasis of mid to late 20th century film editing technology is contemporaneous with a period of unprecedented artistic experimentation and achievement. Use of the analog film editing creative process came to an end at the dawn of film's second, second century. The advent of digital cinema technologies triggered a revolution in the culture, traditions, logistics, and art practice of the film editing. 
Board will suggest that the film industry's migration to digital technology came slowly in comparison to other creative media industries. This is due in part to film industry antipathy to technological change as evidenced by Michael Kahn's use of the Moviola, an analog film device invented in 1924 for his Oscar-nominated film editing of Munich in 2005. In 1990, the avid nonlinear digital film editing tool was introduced and slowly embraced by professional editors across the globe. I was one of the industry's first digital immigrants embracing the technology in 1991 as an early beta tester. While expensive and primitive compared to today's tools, the device facilitated the editor's ability to work quickly, experiment, and save drafts. As the cost of digital film editing technology began to draw, dramatically drop with the introduction of competing tools, the analog film editing era ended. These affordable new tools facilitated greater flexibility, speed, and efficiency that was particularly attractive to documentary filmmakers, traditionally an uneconomically challenged sector of the arts industrial complex. However, the digital revolution utilized radically new tools and methods that required a drastic change in the process of documentary film editing. If process is at the heart of the art of the documentary, as Kerrigan and McIntyre maintain, the creative implications of, th of this technological revolution have profound implications for my community of practice. As a film editor of more than 150 observational and hybrid documentary films over the last three decades, I'm one of a handful, art, handful of artists in my documentary film editing community of practice whose career spanned the transition from century-old analog film era tech technologies to the capital-intensive emergent digital technology of the 1990s and through to contemporary democratized and ubiquitous media-making tools. From this vantage, I saw that new and evolving technologies radically changed how we edit documentary films. The substantial capital investment required for early 21st century digital technologies, coupled with what was initially a false promise of digital efficiencies, led to the develop development of workflows and organizational approaches that focused on speed and productivity rather than, than creative outcomes. A stylistic shift became evident in my creative work and that of my peers during this period of expen exponential technological innovation. I sense there was a distinct relationship between tools and method, an interplay between creative process and creative artifact. Swapping scissors with the mouse click does not rewrite the principles of narrative, visual semiotics, and montage. In the form of silver halide ma magnetic particles of binary data, images and sounds, the raw narrative fodder of the documentary are fundamentally the same. Yet my creative work, my com creative community's work, had changed. <clears throat> Certainly evolving artistic innovation, stylistic trends, audience sensibilities, and cultural, commercial, and political context has significant influence on our work. But again, be, but I began to wonder, is the documentary film editing process simply a necessary product of post-production logistics, or does a useful artistic tool? The existing body of cinema research focuses on the analysis of films rather than filmmaking due to its theoretical basis in literature. In contrast to grand theory, much less attention has been paid to the examination of the film post-production process. The limited body of work in this field primarily focuses on the role of the director. Consequently, much of the scholarly study of documentary film editing examines filmic texts rather than artistic practice. However, a growing body of literature has investigated the film industry's late 20th century transition to digital technology. As technology represents the filmmaker's tools of the trade, it is a crucial con consideration in any examination of the cinematic creative process. Digital technology fundamentally changed the workflow personnel and the essence of filmic creation and post-production. While the creative and economic efficiencies of new digital, technology, uh, new digital tools were attractive, the limitations of these technologies dismantled standard practice. Digital film technologist Sean Cullen suggests that in this context, artistic compromise is a technological imperative. Cullen describes the nature of the transition of century-old film editing processes to digital tools as dancing with a gorilla, and the gorilla always leads. In the capital-intensive commercial art form that is cinema, the ability of digital technology to increase the production, to increase the speed of production, was the central driver of its success. Film editor Leslie Walker lamented the decline of this useful creative constraint of the slow analog process. Because digital editing is so immediate, you sort of rush at it like some sort of lunatic instead of slowly going through it. It makes your th it takes your thinking time away, and I find that annoying. Moreover, the speed and creative flexibility of these tools required self-imposed intellectual and creative rigor. For the documentary film editor, the primary digital advantage is found in the ability to superficially preview vast volumes of footage at high speed. Read from the 
freed from purchasing expensive analog film stock, the lower cost of digital production led to exponentially increasing volumes of production output. Documentary shooting ratios, a comparative measure of raw materials in relation to finished output, increased from an industry standard of approximately 25 to 1 in traditional analog film-based production to as much as 250 to 1 in contemporary digital acquired pr production. Simply put, while the editor of a two-hour analog feature documentary would shape a narrative out of approximately 50, 50 hours of raw material, her digital counterpoint counterpart may attempt to do the same task with 500 hours of raw material. However, as the fixed costs of the film editing process, salaries, office rental expenses, etc., have not concomitantly increased tenfold in the digital era, the time allotted to the editing process remains the same. Thus, documentary film editors developed editing methodologies that prioritize financial and logistical considerations. The literature suggests digital systems facilitate organization and qualitative, qualitative assessment without examination of the content. The subsequent screening analysis of the materials is performed using a system capable of random access playback. Digital technology allows the film editor to scrub the materials. That means you can superficially preview more than an hour of raw material in as little as two seconds. This has led to the accepted industry practice of designing and executing and an editing approach that does not require screening of the raw materials. In my community of practice, documentary filmmakers have come to rely on preconceived notions, production notes, and computer-generated transcripts of dialogue to make qualitative selections from rushes. These decisions are often made by seeing what, in industry parlance, is pops in a scrub. In their analysis of BBC digital film editing workflows, Martin and Mariotigu were troubled by the ethical implications of such high-speed random access selection of decontextualized narrative material. They argue that the nonlinear selection of source materials without considerations of its temporal geographical narrative frame of reference distorts the meaning of the material. Several studies suggest that the speed and scale of the digital revolution in film post-production hindered a necessary philosophical assessment of filmic digitality. 30 years after the introduction of digital film editing tools, researchers are beginning to consider their artistic implication. While well, Danziger argues that digital nonlinear editing machinery has led to a rise in nonlinear narratives in fiction, little attention has been paid to the consequences of this technology on the, on the form of documentary. Haidt argues the impact of nonlinear digital technology and doc documentary film editing poses a challenge to notions of how documentaries are made and, in turn, their form. An examination of the key filmic works within my community of practice suggests a link between the onset of digital technologies and the decline of observational documentary approaches, structural experimentation, and sophisticated visual narratives. The digital era has seen the return of journalistic and formulaic dialogue-driven approaches to the documentary. This study builds on this research by investing the art artistic implications of the use of analog film editing process in a digital context. This practice-based research project seek, seeks to address this practical knowledge gap by investigating these primary research questions. One, can an analog approach to, to the digital film editing process be used as an artistic tool in documentary filmmaking? And if so, how? Two, does an analog era additive construction approach to documentary film editing yield a tonally and stylistically different result than digital era subtractive construction? The methodological approach taken in this practice-based research project is a case study that collects data by the means of, film, of the film editing of two original medium-length documentaries. These films were edited using raw material, filmic raw material shot for and later abandoned by the hybrid observational expositional documentary film, How to Prepare for Prison. These candid unscripted scenes document the criminal trial of M. Lindsay McMillan, a Detroiter wrongfully accused of the vehicular manslaughter of his two sons. The editing process utilizes identical digital technology and raw materials, but takes two distinctly, distinctly different film editing approaches. So just um, a, a, a trigger warning, some of the, the scenes and the ideas contained within in this are, are un, unsettling. It, it, you know, it, it centers on the, the death of two uh, young boys. So if you're sensitive to these issues, you, uh, I understand if you want to leave. The first one that I created, I titled The Way Back, number one, Additive. This iteration was created using the standard process of contemporary digital practice. The use of high-speed, random access digital technology removes all barriers to editorial construction. 
The editor is freed from temporal or geographic associations of the material. Starting with a blank canvas, the absence of external active present tense considerations of time and place means the editor can explore all possible permutations of the material. It must be noted here that the scale of possible configurations is immense. For example, at 24 frames per second, even just three one-second shots can be edited in, all, in an almost limitless number of combinations. The possibilities of reducing, reorder, combining, reversing, or cross-cutting could be, could be expressed in an equation of the factorial of 24 times the factorial of 24 times the factorial of 24. Well, I need to get a colleague in the math department to check my figures. I believe that if 30 seconds of labor was required for each variation, one could spend their entire working life exploring all of the possibilities of three seconds of film. So then how does an editor select, truncate, and arrange hundreds of shots with a combined duration of more than 61,000 seconds in duration, as in this study? The scale of this task can be overwhelming. How does the film editor find shape and meaning with, within the raw material? Not facing any kind of externalities of time and place, the editor must impose a structure on the material. In order to do this, using a contemporary standard practice, I used artificial intelligence to create automatic, automated, uh, automated transcriptions of the Russia's dialogue. After reading and analyzing these documents are prepared was known as a paper edit of the, of the film in a word processor. To be clear, in contemporary practice, the content and structure of a film is largely determined through consideration of the written word, not of the audiovisual elements. Thus, the material is shaped by preconceived ideas. The structure, pacing, and rhythm of the concatenation of the content is imposed on the material, not derived from it. It is shaped by structural conventions, genre standards, audience expectations, and the editor's knowledge and emotional relationship to the material before the film editing has even begun. So here's a little animation that can give you a sense of what the, the, the additive process is. Um, I use the paper edit as a structural guide, and then I begin constructing the film one shot at a time on a blank canvas. There's no inher inherent structural restrictions of time or place, and any kind of technique or style is at my disposal. Continuity uh, cutting, elliptical editing, associative parallel and symbolic montage techniques are all possible. So you can see it here. So this is a, a time lapse. Each one of these actions is, you know, can be anywhere from a minute to an hour to a half a day's worth of work. But you get a sense that it's it's building, starting with a, you know, much like an empty canvas and just adding shots. Using this paper edit. Oops, sorry. Next, here's a short excerpt from the resulting film. I was very confused, not knowing what happened, why. I didn't remember. I'm just as eager to find out as anybody in the courtroom. I'm just as eager to find out what happened. Because I want to know the truth as a father. This iteration of the film is tight and logical. While I'm in the early stages of reflecting on my work, I feel that my storytelling is cogent, efficient, but simplistic. It creates the illusion of order, comprehensiveness, and depth. depth. It is a mediated rather than an immersive film experience. The dramatic question, as it's shown in the excerpt, will M. Lindsay learn what happened on that tragic day, is constructed rather than revealed. It is simplistic and artificial and undermines the dramatic tension of the trial. The structure of the film is nonlinear, but it's organized around the timeline of the accident and thus artificially places as linear. This approach wildly distorts time. M. Lindsay's trial is presented as a single compact synthetic day rather than a process that spanned months. Moreover, I feel the brisk pace and compact structure suppresses the subtext. In this iteration, time serves the need of the editor rather than reflects the reality. Interestingly, the basic structural unit of this editing approach is the, is the shot. The film grammar impl implications of this are noteworthy. With a, without a strong internal superstructure, the running length of this approach is determined by its architecture rather than its content. In this second iteration of the film, I applied an analog working method to digital editing tools. 
The film was edited without transcription, the preparation of a paper edit, or any kind of pre-planning. So this animation shows you, if we just look at the bottom area and the sort of the mango color, it gives you a sense. So I'm starting with what here, you know, scene by scene in shooting order. Um, I'm using all of the material shot in a particular time and place. This material is uh, approximately an hour's worth of material. And you can see editors refer to, to this, analog editors refer to this as boiling the material down. It's sort of distilling it to its essence. So it's a series of excisions that pulls pieces out. <clears throat> so you can get the sense that it, that I, I I'm 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 not cross cutting I'm 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 really limited and so it needs to be faithful to the uh, geographic and temp temporal restrictions of it so it's a, it's a form of creative constraint. Here's a short excerpt from from that version. Back on the record on docket 15 3915, people versus Lindsay McMillan, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Michael Sharp on that. All right. I received a note from the jurors indicating that they have reached the verdict. Are we ready to receive the verdict? Yes, good. All right, the jurors. They have a stipulation off well here. Then at the jury, I received a note from you, and this note indicates that you have reached the verdict. If so, will the poor person please stand and respond to the uh, court question? I will find the defendant, Melanie McMillan, at the count one, regular driving cause of death. Not at the count two, reckless driving cause of death. Not guilty. <laughs> This subtractive analog approach to digital film editing replicates historical technological barriers to construction. The editor must consider the material within its temporal or geographic context. Thus, linear, concrete editorial relationships between raw materials are facilitated. Abstract arrangements are precluded. Constrained by the externalities of time and place, the editor reveals rather than authors the narrative. The selection structure, pacing, and rhythm of the content is derived from the tone of, and substance of the material not imposed on it. The linear, temporally and geographically compartmentalized structure presents a series of causal chronological act of present tense incidents. Profilmic events determine the time base of the documentary, not the past tense events described by the subjects. The ponderous pacing of the trial, while heavily mitigated, removing repetition and pauses, is much more true to life. However, this pacing is rarely seen in, in contemporary cinema and will likely seem tedious as, if considered within genre expectations. However, this also provides the sense of immersion. The length of, of the judicial process, months rather than days, is made clear. Consequently, this film is more narratively complex than the guided experience fostered by additive editing. The subtractive technique creates room for subtext. For example, the judge's concern about the duration of the trial um, subtly reminds us of the socioeconomic context of the Detroit judicial system. A subtle tension between the judge and the defense attorney suggests that there's systemic bias against the defendant. The editorial pacing of the scenes is rooted in the pacing of the pro events. The, the, the nuanced timing of this approach makes meaning. For example, the timing of the defense attorney's responses are loaded with meaning. He uses pauses for emphasis and to let a statement resonate. A pause followed by a request for clarification signals disbelief. The basic structural unit of this editing approach is the sequence. The film grammar implications of this are noteworthy. Without, with, with a strong internal superstructure, the running length of this approach is determined by content rather than construction. However, event facing becomes a consideration. 
A comparison to the added and subtracted film editing processes and resulting artifacts is revealing. Obviously, I had a sense that there would be a difference in the two approaches, but what's interesting is the scale and nature of the, dif of the difference. Moreover, the motivation of the difference was unexpected. Simply put, the digital era additive approach seems to foster an engineered, filtered experience. The analog era subtractive approach seems to foster an immersive, organic experience. I would further argue that while all documentary filmmaking is susceptible to subjective decision making, the contemporary additive approach is particularly vulnerable. This research does not argue for a preferred method. It, it, it attempts to make an original contribution to provincial professional practice by arguing that an analog era subtractive construction approach to documentary film editing yields a tonally and stylistically different result than digital era additive construction. It also argues that the film editing process can be used as an artistic tool in documentary film editing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. That was um, that was fantastic. Um, really interesting stuff. We'll um, we'll hold questions for now, please, and then we'll we'll open them up once we once we've finished. Um, so if I could ask Dan to join us. Okay. And then I'll hand straight over to you as soon as you're ready. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you see the screen? Okay. It's all right. Yeah. All good. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so th thanks very much for listening to my talk. Um, so yeah, as um, Laura said earlier, um, my background is in English for academic purposes. I'm, I'm mainly a support tutor helping students to develop their academic English and academic uh, study skills. But I've also been fortunate um, within the five years at the business school um, to be able to uh, have a voice in learning and teaching matters. And so um, I've been able to, with the help of my boss, explore like the use of things like business documentaries in the classroom for learner engagement. And um, I also uh, have experience of teaching on a couple of level five modules, um, namely exploring business ethics and cross-cultural management. And um, I think perhaps maybe you can start to see some connections with these net fairly recent Netflix documentaries and those particular modules. Um, so first of all, uh, why documentaries? Um, well, I've always been interested in film um, since uh, I was a teenager, um, but my UCAS advisor at Sixth Form College pushed me towards literature at the time. Um, and so when I did eventually start my undergraduate um, literature degree, I was able to take as many um, as many uh, film electives and optional modules as possible. So, so that was great. And um, I was, and that actually made me think that I'm more of a visual learner than I am one who reads. Um, so um, after university, I started to get into documentaries even more. Like, so I started, um, you may remember Fahrenheit 9-11, this is Michael Moore's uh, 2004 documentary. Um, I thought it was impressive when I went to the cinema to go watch this documentary that at the end of the screening, um, everybody stood up in the cinema and applauded it. And I'd never seen anything like that before. I'd never seen it, this kind of communal reaction to a documentary or any film for that matter. And that started to get me thinking a little bit about, you know, this medium and how it can have an emotional impact on the audience. Um, here's a Here's a quote from a pilot study that I did in the summer um, where uh, one of the students uh, commented, um, usually I watch YouTube videos because they are shorter than a documentary and because they're easier to keep focus on. I watch them because they're interesting and I feel I'm becoming more aware of the world around me and I have something to talk to uh, other people and it makes me look a little bit knowledgeable. I, I do also think that's one of the main reasons why I watch documentaries as well. I feel like I'm learning something constantly as I'm watching them. And so um, after I completed my master's, um, which was also on documentaries, I actually sat on that idea for about 15 years. I didn't really develop it, but I was, for my master's, I was interested in how documentaries could be used to develop students' critical thinking skills and their academic writing skills. And so I started to make lessons from um, other documentaries at that time, such as uh, uh, An Inconvenient Truth. You may remember 
this one. It also, I think, came out in the cinema. Uh, to date, An Inconvenient Truth uh, has made something like $50 million in the US box office. And it remains the 11th highest grossing documentary of, of all time in the USA. So again, and more evidence of documentaries and their appeal to, um, to viewers. Uh, and so this has now taken me to the, you know, um, 2022 and I'm doing my DBA on business documentaries and particularly their, the, the proliferation of business documentaries on Netflix, the streaming platform. Um, so in terms of uh, documentaries in the classroom, well, the, the purpose of my research is to investigate the pedagogic value of business documentaries for undergraduate learners. And I've chosen Netflix mainly because it has a fairly clear policy on using its, uh, its content for educational purposes. Um, and in particular, it seems to be the streaming platform that's most focused on that business documentary genre. Um, so you can see here on the screen, here's some screen grabs of uh, the business documentary genre highlighted on the Netflix app. So you can see um, it's got, sometimes it pops up business documentaries, sometimes provocative business documentaries, but it seems to be content that is becoming more popular amongst, especially amongst young people um, who are my learner set. Um, here's a quote uh, from a study. Um, it argues, uh, Smith argues that conventional classroom environments emphasizing textbooks, lect lectures, and an occasional case study often leave students in class fantasizing about how they might handle some envisioned future scenario. So for that reason, tutors within the business school, they may wish to explore using business documentaries as a more visually engaging alternative to textbooks and also as an opportunity to make the world of business more relevant to their students' career development. Um, my research takes the view that business documentaries can be used as a tool to also develop media and visual literacy to better prepare students for their ongoing studies, careers, and personal lives where these critical thinking skills are going to become even more important. So what value does this study have to the university? Well, um, You'll see on the screen here that the graduate attributes were developed in 2011. And I feel that many of the documentaries that I'm looking at on Netflix, they help to raise awareness or help to could have the potential to help develop globally minded students, sustainability driven students. <clears throat> also, um, ideas around inclusivity and of course, being evidence-based and ethical. So I feel like this study is going to perhaps have a benefit on those particular attributes. Um, let's think a little bit about the current approaches to teaching business ethics and cross-cultural management. Um, as I said, these are the two modules that I, I'm lucky to teach on in the business school. And I, and I have the ability to you know, have a little bit of influence on the, the, the use of these documentaries. So um, here's a quote from uh, uh, Assad in 2010. Um, he said that corporate scandals and financial crises demonstrate the complexity of business behaviors and the imperfections of individual decision makers. And so exposing ethical conflicts individuals face in their daily jobs um, and finding ways to prepare students for the ethical challenges they will face is a difficult but critical responsibility. And that, that is the kind of skill that I'm hoping to develop with by using these documentaries in the classroom. And I feel that by having students being able to evaluate documentaries, especially the, um, the methods and the messages used by the director, we can help to um, achieve those higher, higher end learning skills from Bloom's taxonomy, such as evaluation. Um, so moving on from this, um, a, a very interesting study um, that I've come across was conducted by uh, Desai et al. And their study used not documentaries, but feature films uh, to engage students on a cross-cultural management module, which is very similar to my own teaching context. 
Um, the researchers adopted a qualitative and a quantitative approach to explore whether a flipped learning classroom approach using carefully selected films from Lost in Translation to the best exotic Marigold Hotel could help immerse students in a different culture where actual exposure to other cultures is not feasible. And not only did the researchers, uh, here's a look at the abstract, not only did the searchers produce a very rigorous assessment where students presented an analysis of a film in relation to the module's cultural theories that they were learning, but they also demonstrated an increase in students' cultural intelligence scores by the end of the module. Uh, the researchers also produced a list of 101 films to teach cross-cultural management, including a synopsis of every film and notes on how they map to cultural theories, such as those from Gerrit Hofstede, um, as well as comprehensive guidelines on how to use film in the classroom should other educators follow their approach. And, and this study in particular has had a significant influence on my own research methodology and desired output. Um, in particular, many of the studies that we see uh, or the experiments or the use of documentaries in the classroom, it will encourage students to think about the question, how successful was the director in getting their message across? And I, and I find this a very interesting question um, because it does relate to Bloom's evaluation um, in his taxonomy order. Um, but it also gets students to think about the ways in which texts, in this case, documentaries are constructed. Um, and we're hoping that they do that with all types of information sources that they come across. Um, so one of the uh, Netflix documentaries that I've used extensively in my teaching and also forms the focus of the pilot study I did is American Factory, which came out in 2019. This is a documentary acquired by Barack and Michelle Obama's production company, Higher Ground Productions. And it's particularly relevant to students on HRM modules um like cross-cultural management uh, for how it looks at a chinese um based automobile glass making company and its takeover of a, a closed general motors factory in dayton ohio usa the, i think the educational value of american factory lies in how it depicts the cultural clashes and synergies between chinese and american workers in the current era um here's michelle obama um quoted. Um, interestingly, she says, American Factory doesn't come with a perspective. It's not an editorial. I mean, you truly let the people speak for themselves. And that is a powerful thing that you don't always see happen. I think one interesting quote that this quote raises is the idea of perspective and whether documentaries like American Factory ever come without perspective. And educators within the business school may wish to address, address this point with their students to see whether they can identify editorial choices, for example, what to show versus what not to show, or the deliberate use of music for emotional effect, and then discuss how these techniques are leading the audience, in this case, our students, to a particular conclusion. And so that's where the importance of visual literacy and media literacy comes in. This is something that Kim Walden, my supervisor, has been helping me a lot with, and I'm finding it really interesting. Um, so here's a study that was that used American Factory in the classroom. Um, the uh, researcher Schmidt in 2021 used American Factory uh, to initiate role play and discussion with the students so that they could uncover the themes or to speak about the themes that emerge from American Factory, such as conflict, communication, global HRM, labor law, culture, unionization, and employee relations. And Schmidt says the following, he says, documentaries allow students to consider what happened in real situations and how those situations were impacted by the ideas that they learn in the classroom. So my research, it fully endorses this, uh, Schmidt's use of documentaries, but it also seeks to raise awareness of the director's perspective and that there is value in training our students to understand that perspective through editorial lenses or visual literacy. And by doing so, students may be able to apply the same approach to other information sources that they may encounter, for example, opinion pieces, uh, journal articles, as well as the news outlets that maybe have become more pervasive in their social media. Um, in brief, 
Few studies seem to address this approach to critically using documentaries, and this re research will shed light on whether it can help to solve issues, learning and teaching issues within the business schools, such as critical thinking and perhaps even attainment. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about my learner set. Um, my learners are Gen Z learners. Um, Gen Z learners are said to have been born between the 1990s and the mid 2000s. Um, and they typically make up the vast majority of our business school undergraduate learners. They're also said to be the first truly digital natives who value on-demand content and tech forward learning. Um, Gen Z are said to be able to absorb information immediately and lose interest equally as fast. And they tend to search for solutions on the internet as opposed to searching, as opposed to asking for advice. And they're also likely to watch online lessons to learn, but they still do value the, uh, recognize the value of a university degree. Um, so on the screen here, we can see a, a brief, uh, a, a screenshot of, um, which comes from a Pearson 2018 study showing the way in which Gen Z and millennial learners tend to prefer to learn. So you can see on the left-hand side that YouTube has become increasingly um, important for Gen Z learners. And I think the other thing to note in this uh, image here is that th for Gen Z learners, books have actually, printed books have actually become less important. And so that's, although I take this with a pinch of salt and obviously it cannot, Apply, it, it's probably not representative of all learners. It, I feel like the visual, um, the value of visual input by way of business documentaries, for example, it perhaps is going to hold more attraction for our learners, specifically the learners that I'm in contact with at level five. Um, the other thing to note is that many of the learners we have in the business school are BAME and that we at present have a BAME awarding gap. Um, so you can see on the right-hand side that um, the total number of, uh, well, white students um, are outperforming BAME students by approximately 13% there. And then within my own teaching context, this is, uh, you can see at the bottom, this is data from my exploring business ethics module that I work on. Uh, we can see that there's a 15% uh, awarding difference between white and BAME students. So the inform this information uh, within our own teaching context, it seems to reflect also the Pearson, uh, sorry, excuse me, the data from UK universities uh, above. And part of my job um, is to try and address this BAME awarding gap data. So as, a, as an English and a study skills tutor, I am embedded into this in exploring business ethics module. It has approximately 240 students in every intake. And hopefully this intervention may, this visual based inter intervention will go some way to helping decrease that gap. So just a little bit of information about media literacy and why does it matter? As I said, that's what I'm trying to achieve with documentaries, not just use them as a way of, uh, as a vehicle for role play and discussion, but also to um, think about the director's perspective, excuse me. Um, so a few definitions of media literacy. Uh, the BFI defines media literacy as the repertoire of knowledge, understanding and skills that enables us to participate in social, cultural and political life. Um, similarly, Ofcom says that media literacy is the ability to use, understand and create media and communications in a variety of contexts. At the same time, UNESCO says that um, media literacy is information knowledge and they argue that information knowledge and messages are not always value neutral and always independent of biases. I think this point is particularly interesting to documentaries because at least when I was a student, I almost accepted documentaries as fact and that they were value neutral. But through the passage of time, obviously I've come to learn that they that all forms of media come with certain perspectives and biases. And so that's kind of what I'm interested in with the students. Um, they add that any conceptualization use and application of media information literacy should make this truth transparent and understandable to all citizens. And finally, the Council of Europe 
they say that media and information literacy is the main tool for empowering people, communities, and nations to participate in and contribute to global knowledge societies. So by looking at these documentaries, seeing how they're constructed, unpacking that, trying to think about the director's perspective, hopefully this will go some way to helping to develop those media literacy skills that we see are so important to these organizations on the screen. So I won't talk too much about this because but Nick gave an excellent um, uh, overview of uh, documentaries and, um, but I'll mention some of the, um, the definitions that are commonly associated with documentaries. So Bill, Nick Bill Nichols, um, he makes the point that documentaries are traditionally associated with the discourse of sobriety. And Stella Brutzi, she also says that the origins of documentaries involve striving to represent reality as faithfully as possible. As Nick, uh, from his definition said, uh, John Grish and the Scottish document, documentarian, he defines uh, documentaries as the creative treatment of act actuality. While Boardwell and Thompson state that a documentary film purports to present factual information about the world outside the film. So I think all of these definitions are useful in the sense that they take us away from the um, the idea of documentaries as fact and as being uh, value neutral and that of course there are creative qualities to them um, which was really interesting to learn about how that can go that can occur for example in the editing room uh, from Nick's talk. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about the growth of documentaries in cinemas and on, stream, um, on streaming platforms. Um, so uh, perhaps the most famous documentary filmmaker, at least um, the one that I grew up recognizing um, very clearly is Michael Moore. And Michael Moore is renowned for, renowned for his highly performative documentaries. Uh, for example, his debut, Roger and Me, gives one of the earliest business accounts of what happens when a major corporation, um, in this case General, General Motors, lays off a large number of its workforce to save costs. Um, Bill Nichols defines the, the performative documentary mode. This is one of his six documentary subgenres, the others being participatory, poetic, expository, observational, and reflexive. He says that the performative mode emphasizes the subjective nature of the documentarian, as well as acknowledging the subjective reading of the audience. And so in the performative mode, as you can see in the, um, the cover of Roger and Me, the filmmaker, in this case, M Michael Moore, is visible to the viewer, openly discussing his or her perspective regarding the film being made. And this research, my research seeks to explore the current uh, crop of Netflix filmmakers who like more often adopt a performative mode in, or in their approach to storytelling. Um, the Corporation is another documentary, uh, earlier one from 2003. Again, this one's um, Michael Moore is involved in it and explains the growth of large scale organizations and how they've been granted more powers at the expense of society. Supersize Me followed this. This is Morgan Spurlock's 2004 documentary dealing with the aggressive marketing tactics of McDonald's and the effects that um, McDonald's had on obesity. Um, moving on from this, another notable uh, docu business documentary from the early uh, 21st century is um, Enron, The Smartest Guy in the Room, which looks at the corrupt accounting practices of the energy company Enron, which eventually led to its collapse. Um, interestingly, you may be aware that Enron was made into a, a play in London and it, and it had a good run in London. And I found that also interesting for the fact that documentaries are able to inspire other art mediums um, such as theatre. Um, and then as we come on to Netflix, uh, these started to become more common, more popular um, in recent years. Uh, we can start to see them on Netflix, Amazon, Disney, uh, Sky and Apple TV. Um, one of the famous uh, docu-series that has come out on Netflix is the series Dirty Money, which now has two seasons. 
with various episodes focusing um, on the corrupt practices within, for example, the automobile, pharmaceutical and banking industries. Um, and then uh, two other notable documentaries that came out. I mean, there are so many and there and so many of these scandalous documentaries are relevant to the, the different um, departments we have within the business school. This is The Great Hack. Um, this talked about the, uh, the scandal involving Netflix, uh, Net, I'm sorry, Facebook and how it influenced um, the Brexit outcomes or it was used to influence the Bre Brexit outcomes and also the social dilemma. The social dilemma is um, was actually the most viewed uh, documentary on Netflix in 2020. And today, I'll talk to you about it in a minute, the most viewed doc on Netflix is the Tinder Swindler. I think the interesting thing about the proliferation of uh, these documentaries has to do, and, and Nick mentioned this as well, it has to do uh, with digitization. And so Ir Dash et al. Uh, explains how digitization benefited the proliferation of the documentary genre uh, Chapman and Ellison and Baker also point to the reduced costs of filming equipment, uh, the editing and post-production software that was needed, and the need, also the need for large special, specialized crews. So it's clearly a, a popular um, subgenre on Netflix, um, cheap to make, fairly cheap to make these days, and they can offer a very substantial return. Um, I'll, br I'll briefly talk about the uh, spate of fake it till you make it documentaries. Um, these, all of these documentaries on the screen here um, are fairly recent and they involve young 30 to 40 year old entrepreneurs. Um, and what I think these documentaries all have in common is that they offer younger viewers a vicarious experience of entrepreneurship, rapid wealth and fandom but they also are useful as serving as cautionary tales about fraud and reputational da damage. Um, I'm particularly interested in how these documentaries might be used to, to teach things like academic integrity and um, uh, Helen Stamps, who is part of my team, she's on the call here. We've used um, clips from The Inventor, for example, to help show students that any kind of academic integrity issues that you experience here at university could then spill over into your professional life. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested by the, the job fished one. Um, this affected two of my colleagues actually, to have two, two friends who work in the graphic design industry and then they, they recently appeared in this job fished BBC documentary. It was about um, uh, a kind of a rogue graphic designer who was stealing their intellectual property and dressing it up as their own. So no attribution um, and, and, and another example of fraud, basically. Th these stories, they tend to involve people of a similar age. Um, so um, Ali Ayad is the, uh, the, the, the protagonist from the Jobfish documentary. Um, Billy McFarland is the one from the Fire Festival. You may have seen the Fire Festival on Netflix. It's it's a really interesting one. And Jerry Cotton, he's the uh, the crypto crypt, cryptocurrency king. So I, I just think all of these stories involving fraud, the 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 protagonists in them, they tend to be fairly like well, they could have been graduates really. So I'm wondering about like what's what what are we doing at university now that could help to prevent these these scandals from occurring later once the students graduate. But there are other hopeful stories on, um, on Netflix. Um, for example, um, the documentary Own the Room by Foster and Constantini. This shows five students from diverse ethnicities and cultures compete for a prize of $100,000 at the Global Student Entrepreneur Awards. And this motivational type of docu documentary despite being less common, offers immense educational value in promoting the affirmation uh, grad, graduate attributes I mentioned. Um, another, uh, another documentary, not, not particularly well known, is um, She Did That, by, uh, directed by Blewett and Milan in 2019. Uh, this explores the lives of black female 
entrepreneurs as they try to break through the glass ceiling and achieve equal pay to their white counterparts. So I'm also interested in these kind of hopeful stories that can inspire students, not just the scandalous, oh dear ones that I've showed you on the previous screens. Um, so very briefly, I'll just talk a little bit about the Netflix style of documentary that has emerged um, that, well, that I've noticed. I did, I, 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 my observations about the Netflix style of documentary are mainly my own, but then I went onto YouTube and I looked at a number of YouTube videos about how, you, how easy it is or how easy it is um, some of these young filmmakers say it is to make a Netflix style documentary. And those are two videos that you might be interested to look at if you get the slides after. But it would seem that the style of the Netflix documentaries is, 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 is predicated on having very striking images. And, and this is actually um, from the first video. This, the speakers in the video say that the new style of Netflix documentary filmmaking is merging tradi the traditional documentary style with a very cinematic style. So for example, in terms of camera work, um, the importance of a shallow depth of field. I didn't know about this, the Rembrandt triangle, but the way in which the interviewees are lit is uh, apparently the Rembrandt triangle. It's where you can see a, a corner of the person's cheek here. Most of their face is in darkness, but that is borrowing from the, the cinema tradition. Um, use of slow motion B-roll is common in Netflix documentaries use of drones to shoot aerial shots, uh, the visual timeline and the use of graphs and charts for educational effect. Um, it, this part's interesting, the use of Google searches and smartphone clicks and bleeps to, uh, to reflect the modern technology inherent to the story. I, I can't tell you how many times, because my wife and my dogs have to sit through me watching many of these Netflix documentaries and and I, and I know that this is such a common feature in the, the recent documentaries, the, the mobile phone pings from messages because my dog goes berserk when he hears them. He just runs out of the room. I don't know, I think he has like some neurological reaction to like the sound of a, of a, te a text message ping. But it happens so often and it's, it, it seems to reflect the use of technology. So many of these stories, the fake it till I make it ones, they're often involving technology, uh, modern technologies. And then also the use of electric, electronic music. So whenever there's a dramatic reveal, you'll hear like a bass drop. Uh, it's not dissimilar to like that part of a, when a DJ is about to give you the euphoric, the euphoric kind of uplift in the music or the use of a single piano key for drama. So the techniques, tend to be similar uh, amongst them. And I, and I really do need to do more research into this particular aspect of, of the, the form of documentaries so that I can help students to, to, to recognize them. And then the use of assets like archive footage or news reports or clippings for historical context. And finally, dramatic titles. Um, so these are my research questions. Um, what has caused the growth of business documentaries on streaming platforms? What value, if any, do undergraduate students place on business documentaries? Can the use of documentaries in business studies raise attainment? So I'm interested in using a module, two modules from semester A, the same module from semester A, semester B, showing the documentaries to one cohort and not to the other, and then seeing if the students react more positively to the documentary-based input, and perhaps therefore getting better answers or scoring higher in the assessments. And finally, what, recommendation, what recommendations could be used for using business documentaries in the classroom with UG students? I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I'm gonna wrap it up really quick now. Um, so the methodology, it's probably gonna be action research. Um, I'm gonna be using a case study, mixed methods involving surveys and interviews and focus groups. As I said, there will be an analysis of the grades to see whether the intervention worked versus the, the, the cohort without the intervention. The sample is likely to be mostly students, but also staff, perhaps to understand their barriers to adopting the use of this, these lessons in class. That's a brief look at perhaps how the study will be carried out. So 
um, surveying students without the viewings and then with the viewings and then comparing the data. So this will be next year's work. Um, some preliminary findings show that students have been broadly supportive of the use of, say, American Factory, um, especially if they see the relevance of the documentary to their assignments. Uh, the use of short clips, they, they've enjoyed this. This is feeding back on a pilot study that we did in July. So they like the use of short clips. I think that's important. How much of the documentary do you show in class? So far, I'm just selecting key clips from the documentaries. They like the use of breakout rooms to, to facilitate private discussion amongst each other. And, and this is really interesting. This is something Kim and I have been talking about, but because my delivery is online and I teach the students through Zoom, this is mainly because we don't have enough classroom space for English and skills development, but streaming the clips through Zoom and then um, having students use the chat function on Zoom to react to those clips in real time. This is not something that I had imagined doing a year ago, but as I've started to use documentaries in my practice, I've I've learned that that is quite an exciting area. So the idea of second screen, using a second screen to discuss something. But a couple of quotes on the screen, they help to reveal, well, the first quote helps to reveal that I think students are struggling with, you know, finding relevant examples. Um, they don't know all the time where to search for examples. So I'm hoping that, you know, validating the use of documentaries to support their ideas will help to solve that problem. But then in the pilot study, you can see from the second quote here, there are students, this is from a mature uh, female student who took part in the pilot study. She was worried about whether, how the markers would react to her using documentaries in her assignments. Um, would they see them as an academic source? Would it be, would it, would it be, would it be appropriate? Um, so perhaps there's some, education um, or some staff development needed there to help you know raise the awareness of this new form of of um, this new form of uh, source that they can use in their assignments I also very briefly I had some unexpected findings in the pilot study I spoke to a Chinese student and the Chinese student told me about a uh, Billy Billy which is the the Chinese equivalent of YouTube and he said that he watched that regularly to like try and educate himself about you know what's happening in current affairs in the world this is a promotional poster on the left for a chinese documentary called second life i don't have the view count for it but it, it has been enormously um enormously popular in china um i have a little bit of data about it um it's a story about conquering setbacks starting over and compassion and it has been viewed millions and millions of times. It's probably the most successful YouTube-based documentary to come out. It, it didn't have a traditional release. It was released through Billy Billy, which is the Chinese YouTube. And here's a quote from Zhao talking about that very documentary, Second Life. And she said that documentaries have entered their prime in China over recent years. Genuineness is what makes documentaries successful. And that's well indicated by the uh, frequently quoted line that there's more to life than a book. So what am I working on now? I'm trying to turn these documentaries into lessons and I'm using the Articulate software, which is really nice. It's a nice program which helps you to structure a tutorial in, a, in, a, in an, an engaging way. That's kind of a little look at what it looks like. And you can see in the discussion, here's a, here's a question number two, question number two, which is very much aimed at media literacy. So I'm going to be building on that. Got more tutorials, um, one tutorial coming up on uh, environmentalism. And I thought it was interesting. The last thing I'll say is that I watched this documentary, Seaspiracy. It's an interesting one. But it's, it's received a lot of controversy. A lot of the um, people from the scientific community, and particularly marine biologists, they've criticized the documentary for factual inaccuracies. Uh, but also the way in which it treats its interviewees. And I found, although the approach is, the, the approach is actually very similar to uh, a, a documentary which I watched last night. This is Sharkwater Extinction. This is the documentary that um, Nick Hector uh, edited and he actually finished uh, on behalf of the director, Rob Stewart, who tragically died whilst making that documentary. 
but I found it interesting to just look at like two documentaries, both dealing with an identical topic, um, the in danger to you know predators like sharks and the shark finning industries, but getting students to think about documentaries from a variety of perspectives and you know coming to a kind of a more evidence-based conclusion. So that's the end of the talk. Thanks very much for listening. Um, I highly recommend watching Shark Water Extinction. I thought it was a I thought it was a really moving and touching documentary in it. And I think like the, the director's first movie, it has and it will have a very emotional impact with audiences and, and go some way to making the world a better place, I think, by eliminating shark finning. That's it. Thanks for staying with me. Sorry it took so long. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, fascinating talk. If I can ask Nick to rejoin us, that would be that would be great. Um, so two very interesting talks. Very, as I said at the start, you know, very, very, um, very different in terms of their perspective um, and in terms of your aims and objectives and the fields that you're working within. But obviously, kind of studying very similar subjects. Um, so a little bit of crossover there. Um, we don't have an awful lot of time for questions. So what I wanted to do was just give you both the opportunity um, to ask each other a question if you if you have one. I'm not. I don't want to put any Body on the spot but if you have one for each other I'd like to give you the first the first opportunity go Nick uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that you've given me this opportunity uh, Daniel um, really enjoyed your talk and there's obviously a lot of crossover and I'd like to connect with you uh, moving forward I think um, that would certainly help me and I might be able to provide some insight uh, just two um, one question and one uh, a bit of advice that may might be helpful. So the first one was um, you used several times in your in your speech the term or, or use the the term director to imply the sole authorial voice of a documentary. And I'm wondering if you've if you've read about Stella Bruzzi, she she writes this interesting uh, a piece about the role of the subject as being the co-author of the piece. Um, that, that might be something to, to look into. But then also, um, have you considered the idea of, of, you know, where does the money come from for the film? And is is then the funders and the, are the funders and producers also um, authors of the work? No, that, that is a really great suggestion. Kim has definitely been um, getting me to think about that. Like, you know, where does the money come from? Who, you know, how, how are these... Um, documentaries continuing to be so popular. So I definitely look at that. And then, and I will also look at the Stella Bruzzi um, point that you made, yeah, because I am looking at it very much from the director's point of view. And, I, and as you said, there are many different voices, I think, that help to construct that message. So I, I will look into that too. Thank you, Nick. Just, just one more thing, if I, if I may. Um, I don't know if this is helpful, but I, I, I'll share it. Um, it might be interesting for you to look into the. I, I love your piece on, on on the sort of the cliched Netflix formula, and it's 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 something that it's sort of an industry that people have a lot of fun with. Um, but it's it, it it I mean it certainly says something, and it, you might want to look into the origin of the term B roll. Yeah. Um, and because I think it says something will maybe may uh, be useful in your work, and it, it's just the idea that it's um, visuals used sort of removed from narrative that is just wallpaper used to cover over uh, um, dialogue. Um, and, and if you read about how it sort of came to be, it's kind of interesting and says something about the net, uh, Netflix formula. I, I hope that's helpful. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. I, I, I know how important it is, B-roll. Yeah, but I haven't thought about like, yeah, the kind of the origins of it or, yeah, no, that's great. I will look into that too. Thank you, Nick. Dan, any questions for Nick? Yeah, Nick, I was wondering what what what's how do you what software do you use to digitally edit your um, your documentaries? <laughs> um, I am I am digitally agnostic. I use whatever tool I need, and and I won't bore everybody with the details of it. But they're they, they, they're all great and they're all terrible. I just use uh, you know if I need to work with other people, we'll just sort of you know take the temperature of the room and figure out what's useful, but okay. I don't have certainly high, uh, really high ratio documentaries. So shark water, for example, um, there were uh, a, a approximately 500 terabytes of information, um, more than 250 hours of, 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 of stuff. Um, the premiere was the best for that. So I, I would say probably most of the documentaries, certainly the data suggests that um, the industry has shifted towards premiere. I don't know if that's helpful. 
Got yeah. And and one other question: Do do you have you ever had a a a conflict with the director where you've had to shape the editing process in a way which you thought was not serving the story in a in a truthful way or in the way that you thought the story was was meant to pan out? Sorry, it's such a difficult question. Uh, no, it's it's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that is such a great question. So, I, I, yes, I've been asked to, in which uh, I, and I won't do it. You know, you you know, my, certainly ethically, I wouldn't do it anyway. But also, just in terms of professional reputation, um, so I've had to leave projects in the past where uh, it, it, it's interesting. There was one case in which um, it was an advocacy documentary, and I believe the person's heart was in the right place and wanted to make an editorial point that the the material just didn't support. Yeah. So could I, did I, did I believe that um, what the director was asking me to do was existed in the world? Yes, but we didn't have the evidence to support it and I wouldn't do it. So I had to leave the project. Okay. That's really interesting. Thank you. But if, if it's useful, I've, I've worked over the years, like on about 150 films, that's I think happened maybe five times. Okay. It's rare. It's a very collaborative process on film. I think you've uh, I think you've both preempted a lot of my questions which were which which were around authorship because I you know they they were the kind of the clashes between your talks um that that I thought were really interesting um uh, so authorship and authorship and ethics um so you've already answered a lot of what I had down I do have some others but um we've got a couple of people who have questions so I'm going to open it to our audience first David was first in so David Okay, well, first, firstly, thank you for your presentations. Um, I, I've got a question for Daniel um, around, um, it, was, it was actually almost a throwaway remark you said about um, uh, what lecturers would think of uh, students who use documentary as source. Um, and as someone who has to mark a lot of essays and, and, and such things, um, I was thinking about what our reaction would be to that. And uh, as a general rule of thumb, we, we would be going for the no, this is not a suitable academic source, um, mainly because there's a lack of referencing. Um, uh, and this has been an, uh, a discussion we've had with students in the past around the use of vi video essays from YouTube, for example, because there are some very interesting critical theorists in our area that, well, I carefully call them a critical theorist um, in, in our area um, within game studies um, who um, have published some very interesting discussions on YouTube and they've obviously been researched well because they're talking about theorists but there's no bibliography at the end there's no which paper this came from and it's only because we've seen it before so I, I'd be interested to know what your argument is for the inclusion of them as suitable sources um, or, or whether you do sort of agree that these shouldn't be used um, <laughs> for academic work. Yeah, it's tricky because in the pilot study, they definitely were apprehensive about using students knew that they could get marked down for this by, by mm. using them. But I think if they use it in a critical way and, you know, in the same way you might approach it as an opinion piece that they're using, I think that is and then they bring in additional sources to bring in a you know a kind of a, a more academic source to bring in a, an alternative perspective and then I think it's a good thing but I don't really don't know what it would look like you know like I've never I've seen I've asked students to critique things like critique this theory you know critique this methodology and like that's straightforward but I don't know I've never really seen that done in a in an essay or mm -hmm. a report so how it translates I don't know really but I feel like it's valuable. Yeah, I, I think it's the only frustration. Sorry, Laura, uh, it's no, the only frustration okay. I have with um, with documentaries is that they can often have some really valuable learning points that you're like, oh, great, that's really interesting to know. And the question you want to say is, OK, where did you get that from? Yeah. And I mean, that might be a suggestion of, of, of the future of the media, especially with something like Netflix, where you've got the sort of second screen, second screen idea where you're able to you, you're now able to sort of say, well, who's the person on screen? Uh, mm -hmm. At what point do they say, well, actually, yeah, what's the source for this? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
there's there's something really interesting as well in that idea. I mean, we we generally advise students not to use YouTube full stop because mm. there's no quality control. You know, it, it, anybody can kind of upload anything they want. They can have yeah. any perspective they want. And yes, they can get their information from somewhere, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate. Of course, that doesn't mean that it's inaccurate. And I'm not arguing that there are that there are not useful things. I was thinking about this this with you know there you were you were talking about questions of media literacy, Dan, and um, and I think this this relates to that, doesn't it? One of the reasons that we advise students not to use YouTube is because actually quite often undergraduate students are not able or, or, or you know are not advanced enough in their studies to make that distinction between mm. what is reliable and, and, and what is mm. not and mm. it was interesting you were talking about that Pearson study about you know about um, Gen Z learners using YouTube as a, as, as a favoured as a favoured model mm. but of course what they're saying is they, they like watching videos right that that's yeah. but we we say YouTube because that's where the proliferation of, of, of video content is and where it's easily accessible for yeah. students so there are questions there I think about around media literacy and so on which 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 connects David's question, which I think are, are really interesting. Um, yeah. I've just done that awful comment, not question thing. I'm ever so sorry, um, and I'm aware that Kim is 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 in the uh, is in the, um, the 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 list with her hand up. So I'm going to bring Kim in because we are getting low on time. <clears throat> Hi, thanks very much for your for your talks, um, Dan. I have a question for you. Um, are you presuming? I, I I from your talk, I'm kind of getting the sense that you're positing these documentaries as the solution to a potential problem. And I'm presuming that the problem is the high failure rate in those modules that you're teaching at level five and the BAME awarding gap, which is shocking. Um, so what is the line through from the problem to the solution? In other words, what I'd be interested to hear you talk about is the high failure rate in those modules. And you talked about that as a, a sort of a, a, prob a long standing problem. Yeah. What research has been done into why there is a high failure rate in those modules and how do you see the, the resources that you're suggesting as the solution? That's, that's one part of the question I want to ask. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, there, there, there will be more um, research definitely needed to be done into like what exactly is causing our BAME students to underperform in those assessments. I think generally speaking, as a support tutor and as someone who's, uh, mar I have marked those final exams as well. Mm. It seems that there's a lack of um, awareness of current affairs kind of thing like so mm -hmm. a, a student can repeat a theory to you like you know that they've learned and that's fine or they can give you the an example that was used in tutorials like for example the Ford Pinto case study this is the common case study that's used on the ethics module it's like mm -hmm. a classic case study and students will learn the theories behind that and then learn that case study but then if the exam changes and it's um and it asks you to come up with your own um examples or knowledge of current affairs or what's happening in the business world, then I think they, they struggle. They can, they, I, I don't want to make, I, I don't want to say it's a lack of curiosity, but I mean, I and certainly when I was their age, I wasn't reading a newspaper regularly, you know, that kind of thing. I only, only that only happened in my early kind of like 20, 22, yeah. 23, something like that. So it's about trying to bridge that gap, I think, you know, like when you're about 20, 21 and like making you curious about the, the world about things like sustainability or the fit the fishing industry like we saw at the end and mm -hmm. so I think it can help in that sense you know it's uh yeah so so in that case um you're suggesting that those documentaries are not going to be used as secondary sources but are going to be used as primary sources case studies yes yeah that we're gonna like that like those tutorials I showed at the end like we're going to see whether that did like and so in from the pilot study I did get some feedback saying oh not only did I watch American Factory but then I went out and went on to not great but Wikipedia and then read more about it so it led them on a journey of reading so it was like the catalyst for like learning more about the subject so it's um I think that that's possible I think I th yeah uh, which, which, which is absolutely fascinating uh, and kind of begs the question about how media literacy is is taught as a sort of generic skill um, that can enable those, those um, documentaries to be used as case studies, I suppose. Yes, 
yes, I think so. They've got to be careful with them and critical of using them and, and not just rely on that as the source of information and think about the speaker, who is the speaker, where, where, where are they coming from, what's the, what knowledge do they have, but I think it's, that's a useful experiment. Look forward to working on that then. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kim. Um, we are coming at, we, I mean, we are at the end of our session, really, but I can see that Nick has his hand up and I have a question for Nick as well. So we will just run over by a few minutes. But if anybody needs to leave, then that's absolutely fine. Totally understand. Um, I, I was going to ask Nick a question, but I can see that Nick's got his hand up. So I'm going to let Nick ask one first in case, because I'm assuming his probably slots in to the discussion that we're already having. Uh, thank you, Laura. Um, if, I, if I may speak as a, as a maker rather than, a, you know, a, a student. Um, the the goal of a documentary filmmaker, if not that I can speak for the entire community, but in my experience, um, is not to inform; it's to engage. And so, just how you eloquently put it about you know th that inspired uh, you to, to do further reading. That's the goal of the maker is not to that this is um, that we're providing information. It's simply to inspire people to do their own research and 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 and, and crack open a book. I don't know if that's helpful. That was really helpful, yeah. I remember you saying that in an interview as well, that it's the documentaries on about facts, exchanging facts. It's about having emo an emotional connection with the um with with the with the person, with the audience. Sure. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Steve. Nick, I just wanted to I just wanted to ask you you really quickly because we've we've kind of jumped straight to, to Dan's questions. Um, but I I I wondered, obviously you started. You both talked about definitions of documentary um, quite a bit, and this was this is obviously you know quite significant to you and your research, Nick. Um, and you've talked about uh, as well how this kind of you know the additive the additive subtractive uh, variations change your kind of change your experience and if I'm not mistaken, your enjoyment of of the creative process kind of really has an impact um, and really kind of uh, varies depending on the approach that you're taking. My question is, does it also impact your definitions of documentary? Does it does it start changing what documentary is to you when you look at these these different these different methods? Uh, what a great question. I, I wish I had an equally great answer for you. I, I struggle with the to term. Think about. We can discuss it in a later meeting, by all means. <laughs> Well, I, I struggle with the term documentary. I just think it's just such a broad term. I mean, as 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 Nicole says, it's to the point of being meaningless. So, in terms of the work that I do, like I'm, I struggle with the definition. So, I, I you know, in the the, the bio that I provided, um, I, I used um, a hybrid expositional observational documentary. Um, a, a colleague of mine, a, a noted filmmaker, uses the term uh, actuality drama, and I think that that sort of really, I think describes what it is that, that I like to do. That's the idea that you're um, using the raw stuff of, of actuality and shaping it in some narrative form. So that's how I, I look at it. So it, it has the, 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 it has the research, um, sorry, does the approach uh, change my enjoyment of it? Um, no, but I, I, I and I, I don't think that there's like a one size fits all approach. I think that you just need to see that there's, you know, the and and I I, I hope to do further research. Um, so this is just one approach. So I'm wondering if there are other legacy ways that we can sort of uh, tackle tackle media, and that, that that is sort of in my uh, my toolbox as a as a as a as an artist to be able to just dip into different uh, approaches and to achieve different results. But I'm I'm very concerned as an older filmmaker. So editing is particularly documentary film editing is a young person's game. Um, there are certainly in in my community of practice there are maybe at this point five or six in the entire country people whose career spanned from analog to digital. So talking to young people in the digital realm, they're just unaware of, of, of how things used to be. So if my contribution is simply sort of preserving that knowledge and opening people's ideas up to, there are other ways than sort of using AI and imposing your will on the material. Uh, you know, if, if that's all I achieve out of this, I, I'll be satisfied. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, I've got other notes, but I think I'm going to leave it there because we are we are running a bit late and people are starting to drift off. So um, I will save them until we meet next time. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much to everybody who came along. Thank you for a fascinating discussion. But big thanks to Nick and Dan for two fantastic presentations. And um, I look forward to hearing more about their research in future. Thank you, everybody.